We are now going to turn to our first fireside chat, although it looks a bit more like a, a barroom chat. The theme of this first is vision, and our speakers are going to reflect on the early days of the global internet and how we arrived at the current juncture. Indeed. This conversation is going to be moderated by Gus Hossain, uh, Executive Director of Privacy International, who will be in conversation with two brilliant speakers, Shara Nas Edry, co-founder and privacy consultant, and Joe McNamee, Edry, former Executive uh, Director and advisor to the European Parliament. A big round of applause, please. <laughs> Like many of you in this room, I love that I get to work on tech, data, and policy every day. Um, but let's be honest, the people who work in this sector, ourselves included, we didn't choose this because we want an orderly life. <laughs> and so if you can imagine building an organization in this kind of space, it's, it's hard. The road is full of accidents, a little bit of chaos, but some beautiful moments along the way. In 2001, an old friend of ours, Maurice Westling, had an idea, an idea for an organization that could do work in Brussels. Turning that idea into something meaningful, that then became the next challenge. And I can't believe we're here 20 years later. Doing it with others, <laughs> that was actually the hardest bit. We organized the meeting, I remember this, in, in um, Amsterdam in 2002, where we had a number of people fly in from, from the US. We had Barry Steinhardt from France. We had Miriam Marzuki. We had Casper Bowden. And we spent the weekend yelling at each other. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Trying to organize ourselves into an organization is not easy. Tony Bunyan of State Watch actually said, um, oh, it's a great idea. Just don't base it in Brussels. <laughs> and then from there, we tried to imagine actually maybe even hiring somebody at some point and having them have somewhere to work and maybe even a desk to work on. But the reality is that we also had to um, go through Belgian nonprofit law and going through draft after draft of drafting all of this. It was horrible. It was unsexy and it was <laughs> abstract. But then it became real. And it's because of the people on this stage that there were some very real moments that followed. So Shura was at Bits of Freedom in those most earliest of days, and Joe was executive director for 10 formative years. So Shura and Joe, open it up to you. When did it actually start feeling real, like this was something that might actually work? So we had a letterbox in Brussels, and at some point we found it, and we, we managed to go, go through the bureaucratic loopholes, but we didn't have money for an office, and we hired one person part-time to work from his bedroom in his private apartment. Uh, and, and we had a letterbox at a friend <laughs> that we forgot to open to re-register <laughs> annually for Edry. So no, the first years were not a party, but we had a digital network. So the physical presence in Brussels was not that important in the first few years, but then Joe came in. Um, <laughs> well, that's not entirely true. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of momentum, a lot of light that wasn't a laser yet. Um, the, the campaign against the Software Patents Directive, um, for those of you old enough to remember, um, <laughs> They let the, the old people's home <laughs> open. That's <laughs> nice. The people you see, cr the it's person you see too. crying next to you, is one of the people who worked on the software patents directive. <laughs> <laughs> the software patents directive was amazing. It was a small number of people with passion and drive and energy and motivation, who did unbelievable things. And this band of 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 people brought down a proposal that was supported by the Commission, Parliament, and Council, yeah. <laughs> and somehow still managed to win. But they, they did it at a huge personal cost. And um, I was working in industry at the time, and I was looking at it from a distance, and I thought, 
that was amazing, but it's, it needs sustainability. It needs, it needs some sort of ability to run two campaigns at the same time or one campaign followed by another campaign. So, they, so that energy and that talent was, was there already. Um, and the Edru Graham, the, the vastly underestimated uh, newsletter that Churas set up in 2003, um, meant that Edri had a name in Brussels when, when I got the funding to start, start the office. And that meant that doors were open to me when I, when I said I was from Edri from day one. I had, um, and there were people coming to Brussels from, uh, from Austria, from, from Germany, from around Europe to speak at European Parliament and other events. So there was all of this energy and respect and diligence in the community already. And the great thing from my perspective was when I opened uh, the office with the help from, um, from OSF funding, everyone thought <laughs> that I started it. And I, I created all of this energy and I created all of this, this, uh, this respect, but it, it, it had all been done in, in the really difficult years between 2003 and 2009. It's like, yeah, that, that moment for me when it became real was when I saw a photo of Shura at the European Parliament with the petition yeah. of how many people? It was like tens of thousands of people. Yeah, I don't know how many, but a very big pile of signatures. <laughs> against communications data retention. Yeah. An issue that was so hard to get across. Yeah. You managed to run a campaign and get people to sign up back in, what, 2004? Four, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, it, it, it made it more realistic for me as well, because we, we were two people in an office in Amsterdam, Bits of Freedom, Maurice and me, and, and we saw all of these... NGOs that were like manned, except for Privacy International, which was at the time like a very inspiring model of a professional NGO. The rest of us were all like unpaid volunteers that did it as a weekend job uh, for passion. And we created the network through Edry to get to know each other. And thanks to that network, we could like launch this first campaign and everybody advertised um, the, the anti-data retention campaign and we got the signatures and uh, that was a, a, a happy moment for me as well because until we sort of actually launched that website, we didn't know how many people would dare to sign <laughs> and how big our uh, yeah, support in, uh, across the EU would be. And when, when I, I worked there between 2003 and 2006, and then I went over to the Dutch Data Protection Authority, and uh, we were with eight organizations when I left, and I just looked up that there's now 47 members of Adrian and, and 20 people f staff at the office. I can't believe how well you've all done. And so I'm, I'm curious also, while we have things to celebrate, was, were there moments where you thought it might actually all come crashing down? Well, really only the first half of the first year and the second half of the first year <laughs> and the second year <laughs> and the third year. <laughs> I think we were well into our, I was well into my seventh year in Edry when I thought this might actually work. This organization needs an executive director who knows how to run a sustainable organization. And uh, now you have one. <laughs> oh, we, we were kind of, uh, well, punkers, you could say, like typical rule-averse people. And we were not very good at creating procedures and rules. And that was very much to our disadvantage because we had to work together. From the start, there were cultural differences <laughs> in how Edry should be run and how we should collaborate. And when I look now, I, I really appreciate the work that's been done in creating such a stable organization with all the minutes and policies and rules and decision-making uh, procedures. Uh, and it's necessary. It's horribly boring, but it's necessary. So imagine you're at a bar and somebody comes up to you and says, you, you used to be at Edry. And you'll say, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and they'll say, okay, well, tell me about a moment that captures its magic. What was that moment that you felt 
We didn't rehearse this. No. <laughs> I had a drink before. <laughs> and I, I think the, the, the moment, I think that the, the diligence and the, the quality that was in Edry before I joined um, meant that there was a certain standard that had to be met even, even by me. And um, I had a, a meeting with, uh, with the German uh, parliamentarian about ACTA. And he, we discussed the ins and outs of the, what was proposed. And at the end of the meeting, he said, well, you guys don't tell the truth anyway. I don't, I, you're spreading misinformation, so, so, I, so I, don't, I don't care what you've got to say. And I stopped and I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. You're going to look at the Edry website, and you're going to find one example of one thing on ACTA or on anything that's not true. And when you do that, you bring it to me, and I will make an apology in any place at any time. And he never, he never responded, never found the mistake, never found the misinformation. And that was, that wasn't, that was, I knew that all of my colleagues, I knew all of the contributors to the Edrigram would not do that. They were professional, they wouldn't make a mistake, they wouldn't tell a lie, and I was able to shut him up permanently on that accusation. <laughs> and that's when I knew that this, this was a special organization with special quality and special talent. And so the organization, as we can see just barely right now, because the lights are so bright, <laughs> is so vibrant, so much larger than just a few in the original edugram. What's your final message to the next generation? Uh, yeah, be good and, and, and remain good. I mean, uh, I, I, I've been working in this field for over 20 years now, and there's plenty of opportunities to do good. Don't go into the revolving doors. Find another job or opportunity, but keep on being good and spreading the good. And uh, I'd just like to say, I am so flattered. Every time I see one of you in one of the institutions, I am so flattered that I was part of the organization that you represent. It makes me, it, it, it makes me feel so proud that you are so good and that in a little way I opened a door that allowed you to do what you're doing today. So thank you, wonderful people. So let me just uh, close this where I started it. NGOs are, they're hard. They're full of accidents, a lot of conflict, more than a little bit of chaos, but some beautiful moments along the way. Edry started with an idea, a lot of fights, the dream of an office, now there's an actual real office, and so many people, and that's, that's the, it's the people thing that matters the most, which is, when we were in those early meetings, we never imagined, let alone a 20th anniversary, we never imagined there'd be so many people who are a part of this. And that's the legacy, not the impacts. And like the ACTA stuff is great, don't get me wrong, but it's not the impacts that leave a legacy. It is the fact that there are people around this and not just the people in the past, not just the people who are here today. And it's beautiful to see you all here today, but we know that in five years, there'll be a whole new generation of people coming to the next celebration. And it'll be because of all the beautiful moments from here to there. So thank you for the hard work that you've done over the years. And thank you, everybody, for just being part of this beautiful journey.